Hello, this is Jason Kendall, and welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. We're going to take a veering away from introductory astronomy significantly on this one when we talk about one of the most modern things that has occurred inside of the science of astronomy, as well as one of the most important things to happen in the last few years for all of physics and literally all of science. And it's the discovery of gravitational waves or disturbances in space-time itself due to the motions of extraordinarily violent collisions due to black holes. So I call this affectionately in one of my public talks, Black Holes and Gravitational Waves, the Warp and Woof of Spacetime. If you don't know what the Warp and Woof of things are, you gotta go look that up. But this, it's also, there's, you know, woof like, woof like a dog. So it barks in the warping of spacetime and warp and woof for you to go look at it. In any event, Let's start off with a big explosion. So on September 14th of 2015, the LIGO Observatory received a signal of two colliding black holes that collided together 1.3 billion years ago. The two black holes were about 30 times the mass of the sun. One was a little bit larger than the other. And the stars around them that you see here as they merge together, the gravitational field of these two merging black holes formed an enormous, enormous, enormous uh, wave in space-time. And as they waved, yeah, it's going to go in loop because I'm going to talk about it a bunch of times. So they, as, as they merged together, they formed a single black hole. And the, the stretching and warping of space-time released three or so solar masses worth of energy. What you see in here, the ring around the stars is called an Einstein ring, and, it's the, and the light from all the stars is being bent by the extreme gravity around them. So really that ring that you see around the two black holes, that single black hole at the end and the black holes at the beginning, is a result of stars directly behind the black hole with respect to our line of sight. And so it's not actually, the stars in the background aren't moving. That's just the path that the light takes to us from those distant stars so that we can see them. Now this isn't actually what was seen. This was not the actual observation. This is a computer simulation showing what occurred if we were close by, if we were close by in space. There would probably be a little bit crazier things happening there. That bending and stretching that you see there would be something that we would be part of because that's the stretch of length and space and time itself. So it would be a, you know, it'd be like a being inside a funhouse mirror and you're really being stretched and pulled. That would be kind of a violent place to be. So this is gra the gravitational lensing that you see there would also be something that's seen from every direction around them, but it's just our particular view from where it is. And so there's also the gravitational waves are being emitted, as you can see, after it's done, the sloshing of the image as after they merge together. So during this collision, the power output in gravitational waves was far greater than the luminosity, I mean, all the light put out of all the stars in the entire observable universe put together. The collision of two black holes, which are only each about a couple of miles across, is actually the most powerful explosion that astronomers have ever seen aside from the universe's Big Bang. This, dis this detection was done by the LIGO Observatory on, on September 14th of 2015, and that signal was first seen, and eventually, after looking at, the, uh, looking at it, it was determined that one of the black holes was 36 times the mass of the sun, the other one was 29 times the mass of the sun, and the resulting black hole was only 62 times the mass of the sun, which suggested a way, suggests that the gravitational wave signal, that warping that you see, carried away three solar masses. So three solar masses was converted into wave energy propagating through space-time itself, and that is about five times 10 to the 47th joules of energy, if you really must think that. But really, it's, it's just an enormous, enormous thing. All right. What's interesting, though, is that because there are waves that are propagate outward from this black hole, you could actually think of them as having a frequency and a pitch. And in fact, their frequency and pitch is actually such that they would be audible in the, in the human spectrum. So what we're seeing here is the actual pitch perspective of how fast it went 
each of these two black holes went along uh, at, as time went on, and you see that they, uh, from the left-hand side, we see the signal themselves, and the signal rises out of the rises out of the background. And if you go check it out on the LIGO website, you see that it has a whoop 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 sound, which is really kind of fun. And this is, shows the actual appearance of the signal and how long it took to do the collision. So the simulation in the past was very, very, very wrong in terms of its time frame. The signal itself in that final collision took less than a, less than a tenth of a second. As a result of this discovery, and notice there's two indications, one from LIGO at Hanford, one from LIGO at Livingston, and you can see the frequencies in Hertz are those of human audio, uh, human ears, but they were really quiet. They were so very, very, very quiet, but yet they were, if they would have been audible had they been louder and closer. That's a weird thought. And so they're called chirps because they go up at the end like whoop, like that. That's how they sound. They sound like whoop, as they come through. This discovery led to the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2017. So the LIGO uh, Observatory of Gravitation, LIGO, which is the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave, Gravitational Wave Observatory, or LIGO, and involved over a thousand people, roughly 1,200 researchers in about 20 countries, and this whole project took about 50 years from its first idea till the discovery. And the Nobel Prize laureates, um, which were each incredibly important to this, to this, um, to this, the creation of this, were uh, Rainer, uh, Reiner Weiss, uh, and the other half was to Barry Barish and Kip Thorne. And these three people were the main leaders in creating and developing the LIGO Virgo collaboration. Uh, which observed the which the creation of the detector as well as the final observation of them. And so I provide that web link on the Nobel Prize for you to go look at. And this actually began kind of back in the 1970s after Rainer Weiss uh, did analyze some possible sources for background noises that could disturb measurements of gravitational waves. And so he had eventually designed a detector of some kind and actually he presented it to Barry Barish and Kip Thorne and Kip Thorne thought, well, I just wrote a big book on gravitation uh, with Misner, Thorne and Wheeler, which is one of the key books of, of general relativity. And in that book, he said gravitational waves will never be observed because you can't make an instrument sensitive enough. Well, it's interesting to write the book that says it can't be done and then go out and do it, isn't it? That's exactly what Kip Thorne did. He became one of the most important people in it because he said, well, wait a second, that's what I wrote. So he, of course, added a chapter later on to and revised his book. So this is a, so this is a laser-based interferometer, and that could overcome the noise. And Kip Thorne and Rainer Weiss were early on convinced that it could be done, and so they pushed it through to one of the largest projects that's ever been funded by the National Science Foundation in the United States' is history. So where did this come from? All right, why do we think there's gravitational waves? Well, the first thing we have to remember is that gravitational waves are a result of a new way of thinking about gravity. Gravity, as thought by Newton, was very different than we think about it today. Newton, and the key thing is that Newton's formulation of gravity says that the force due to gravity propagates instantaneously throughout the cosmos. It only depends on the masses of the two things gravitating and their distance. It has nothing to do with time in the force due to, in the in his equations. However, the reformulation of gravity in terms of space-time meant that time itself was part of the equation, and so therefore disturbances or changes in the locations of masses or their distributions will cause changes in the gravitational field, and those changes propagate out at the speed of light. So what's the equivalence principle, and where did this all come from? The concept that Einstein had about the nature of gravity came about from the equivalence principle. He first developed the concept of special relativity in 1905 with the idea that, you, that, that all laws of physics are, no matter, are the same no matter how they move with respect to each other. No matter how they're moving, they move the, they, all laws of physics are the same. That means every law of physics, including quantum dynamics, electricity and magnetism, 
Galilean relativity, a Newtonian mechanics are all the same for what he called an inertial observer. An inertial observer is somebody that's inside a box, inside a reference frame, inside a room with lots of sticks to do measurements and clocks to do measurements of time. And that's how you do your measurements of time and, and space. And either you're in free fall, such as the uh, description, uh, such as the little cartoon in the lower left, or you're and you're floating, and so you can't tell if you're floating, which is the lower left, or if you're in free fall, like the lower right, you still can't tell if you're floating in space or in free fall. They're the same thing. There's no way to tell whether or not they're the same thing. Or you could be moving at a uniform speed. Now, if you look in the upper right, that's not a uniform speed because the engines are on. So let's say you are floating in space and moving to the left really fast at half the speed of light or something like that. Or you're driving down the highway at about 80 miles an hour and there's no turns or twists and maybe it's out in Wyoming or something like that where you can drive for 30 miles and you don't hit anything. So either you're moving with a uniform speed or you're in free fall, you can't tell if you're floating or standing still. Or you're moving in, or you're falling in a uniform gravitational field. There's no way to tell any of these apart. So general relativity says you extend the concept to of, of special relativity to include gravity as a fundamental interaction that's relative to the observer. And so Newtonian gravity said that there was a force between two masses that acts instantly. But, but now we can think of it instead as you're falling into the shape of space-time. So the reason the guy in the lower right is falling is because that's the shape of space-time. He follows the lay of space-time. So mass tells space-time how to curve, and then matter follows that curvature. That's what we mean by, that's what the end result of the equivalence principle is. In addition, the con where gravity then comes in is that in the up top two cartoons, we see a person standing on the Earth experiencing 1g of gravity, which is 9.8 meters per second squared of acceleration downwards. Or you could be in a rocket out in space where the rockets are pushing you from below at 9.8 meters per second squared with a thrust, a force, due to the rocket engines at 9.8 meters per second squared. Now, of course, one person's on Earth and one person's in a rocket, but everything else, all other things being equal, will be equal, meaning the every other experiment will be on a rocket will behave just as though you're dropping something off of a table. So if you had a table and push something off, it would fall downward and accelerate down to the ground, just as if you were on Earth. And if you were on Earth, and he threw something up in the air, it would fall back down. And that's exactly what would happen inside a rocket. So you can't tell the difference of any kind of acceleration. You can't tell the difference between the acceleration due to gravity and the acceleration due to any other force, such as a rocket or something like that, or being pulled up very rapidly by a cable. And that's what the equivalence principle says, is that not only are the physical laws the same, no matter how you move with respect to each other, but it also says that you can't tell the difference between your inertial mass and your gravitational mass. They are the same thing. So Newton's mass that he derived from his laws of, of motion and his definition of inertia then becomes the thing that is inside of gravity itself. And so this concept of mass then is that mass can, is, affects space-time and in fact warps it and changes its geometry such that other masses obey the geometric shape that has been put down by a bigger mass. So that's what the essentials of this equivalence principle are. And so when we think about what we mean by the as move, we then say things got to move, right? So how do you know if things move? Well, you need a meter stick and or, or some sort of measuring tape or some way of measuring distance. And so that distance measurement is incredibly important. But you also have to, in order to say how things are moving, that says things have got to take time to get here from there. So time is an element too, and so speed and time are important. So when you integrate them all, you have to say, well, why do things fall? They follow the shortest possible path in space-time. That's what they do. And that shortest possible path, its length is called a, a metric. And the metric is the thing that combines space and time 
together such that you can say it has to take the shortest possible path in space and time, which is an interesting concept. So the, now we're going to get into the meat and bones. I talked about this in my general relativity lectures, but I'll give little tiny bits here because, you know, what the heck, here we go. In the upper right-hand area, we see the equation, which is called, which is the Schwarzschild metric for a weak gravitational field, such as around the edge of the sun or at the surface of the Earth. So the left-hand side of that, that little ds squared, is the, is the path length in space-time squared, just like Pythagorean theorem. We take the square of one side and square the other side and the hypotenuse. That's where that's really coming from, in essence, is equal to there's, uh, there's some factor that involves the, with the, the gravi Newton's gravitational constant, g, and the mass, m, and the distance, r, and the speed of light squared. And you take that thing in parentheses and multiply it by the speed of light squared and multiply it by a length of time squared. So that's the time length that we are going. And then you do that same little thing, but instead of minusing it, you plus it, and you have little dr squared, which is height above. So we're assuming a spherical thing like an Earth, and how high we are above the Earth is dr. That's its altitude above the surface, or above the center of the mass, or from, that's a good way of talking about it. And the, 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 the d omega squared, r squared, d omega squared is like left and right. But we're only worried about up and down for that metric. And that's the gravitational metric, or for a weak gravitational field, we are going up or down inside the gravitational field. Now, we can reformulate, there are many ways you can actually make a metric and, me and measure space, the length in space-time. It depends on the conditions. The metric at the top shows what it's like near something like the Earth or the Sun. But if you now take some two big black holes and smash them together, they're going to affect space-time in a very strange way. But very, very, very far away from those two black holes when they collide, that wave that happened will diminish as, as space-time, as, as they progress through space-time, because they spread out. So as the waves spread out through space, uh, as they progress, as they travel away from the event that created them, they spread out and get weaker and weaker and weaker. In fact, they get so weak that they almost get to the point where they're just tiny bumps of, on, in, in, front of, in front of flat space. So flat space, just it, it, we get rid of the 1 minus gm on the top and the 1 plus 2 gm over r squared thing at the top, and we're left with we, we're left with almost the thing in the middle that I show, which is now a path length ds squared, and there's no effect on time from gravitational waves, but there is a stretching to the left, and there is a stretching to the right as the waves travel up, dz. So x is left, um, x is left and right, dy may be, uh, may be forward and backward, and z is up and down. So as the wave travels from the top, to the bottom, it'll affect things going left and right and forward and back. And that's what those little H's stand for, is the tiny, tiny, tiny bumps and deviations that occur to flat space-time very far from a gravitational wave source. And so we can model, since it's a wave and it's, it's periodic, we can approximate, we can, we can take as our first guess that the little tiny h's will, will be functions of time just like a sine wave. And so a sine wave is just a water, like a, a very simple water wave, or sine waves are just a, are a way of, if you take a, if a sine wave can be best thought of as, as just a simple oscillator that goes up and down, and as you watch it go back and forth in time, take a spring, a, 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 like a, a weight at the end of a spring, and lift it up, the, and then traverse it, and then carry that spring as it's going up and down, off to the right. Now, if you're smart, you do this in a dark room, and then what you do is you have a light, the, the bob at the end is a light, so it goes up and down, and you make a, and as you walk this thing, there'll be a wave-type pattern that goes up and down and up and down, and you'll see that, and what you see as it travels will be a sine wave. And that's described by the amplitude A times the sine, which is the sine of how fast the, the frequency of the wave, w, times the time that it goes, and so as you move, minus z, which is, you know, a little bit off from where you started. So that's the phase angle difference of that. So that gives you some periodic variation in the lump of space-time. 
And by small, I mean really small. One part in, say, 10 to the 21st. There's very, very, very few things that we ever measure that are that small because we think of dollars and cents, we only think of like one penny, which is one one hundredth, or 10 to the one part in 10 to the second. Even if we think of things like trillions of dollars, we're only thinking of 10 to the 12th, like one dollar out of a trillion is only one part out of 10 to the 12th. But this is 10 to the 21st, and that's getting really hard to measure what that really means. So it's tiny. It's extremely tiny is a, is a good way of thinking about it. Um, another way to think about it is that the size of an atom is about 10 to the minus 10th meters. That's the size of an atom. And, that, and what would be 10 to the 11th meters? Well, that would be something extremely big. That would be uh, well, that would be a ten to the ten to the uh, ten to the eleventh, ten to the eighth kilometers. Ten to the eighth kilometers is about is about a light second away. Well, it's about it's about a thousand light seconds away. So that's that is well past the moon. So we're talking uh, the diameter of a yeah actually would be much past the moon, be out past Mars. So uh, yeah, ten to the eighth kilometers, not ten to the fifth. So it would be a thousand times further out past to the orbit of Mars. So something compared the the diameter <clears throat> of an atom compared to the uh, distance to Mars. That's kind of a, that's on the order of ten to the twenty first of a different size scale. So this is a tiny, tiny, tiny change. So we're not expecting to see a funhouse mirror far from this from the event. So how do they move? And this is even more math. I'm sorry, but you got to take it because it's, you know, it's your medicine today. And the upper right hand corner, we're showing that little tiny, tiny, tiny equation, which shows the bump. So I made the equation really tiny, but we can take pieces of that equation, the right hand side. And then we see the geo that this equation that we have at the top is called the geodesic equation. And that geodesic equation looks at variations in time, variations in space, and shows the product of their variation of, t of like space of time and space and compared to the acceleration of these things. And that variation is called the geodesic and it says how do things vary as, as, as things propagate through? What are, what are some symmetries to the space time? How will things move? So the geodesic equation, if you plug things in, will show you how things move given a metric. So that'll show you the shortest paths. So plugging this stuff into that equation gives you the shortest paths. But the changes that the metric shows are so incredibly tiny that there's almost, there are literally almost no changes to the geodesic, meaning there are no path changes in terms of the coordinate changes. So it doesn't push things across coordinate lines. It stretches the sizes, but it doesn't change the coordinates of anything. It's kind of a weird thought, meaning that the changes are so incredibly tiny, you can't actually see the, the it doesn't push it across the tick marks of a ruler. So a tick marks of a ruler, the whatever's being pushed, don't get pushed across those tick marks. So you can't measure the change with the coordinates. However, there is a distance change because once you add up, all of the the, the 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 tiny pieces of the change as time progresses then there is a distance change across a very very large section so while there's no coordinate system change there's an actual length change because the coordinates themselves get stretched and pulled meaning this is weird meaning the ruler itself gets stretched and pulled and squished and pulled as things progress so you can't tell that there is a change but there is a length change. And so that length change is called the strain. And that length change, we're calling it the little bitty tiny delta length of t as a function of the real uh, length, which is the average change. And that's proportional to that sine wave we thought. And so we have, it's the last bit is called the strain, which is mean how far is the length being changed? And this is the thing that when people say what we're talking about, this is what, uh, when they say, oh, it's this, when we're going to talk about it, oh, it got shifted by this much. This is what we mean. These are the equations that we had, is looking at the actual length changes or path length that was done. So even though there wasn't a coordinate change, the coordinates themselves, the meter sticks themselves get stretched. 
So you can't do this with just one meter stick. So you have to have something that can detect a change, a relative change in distance to on the order of 10 to the minus 21st first. So that's kind of small and that's equivalent to saying, so again, let's give another good analogy. If you look at one of the little hairs that from your head that might have fallen to your desk while you've been listening to this and nodding off, but your hair might have fallen to the desk and the width of your hair, that's very small. But imagine comparing that to the distance to the nearest star, Proxima Centauri. The width of a human hair is a less than a tenth of a, is about a tenth of a millimeter. The distance to Proxima Centauri is about four times ten to the thirteenth kilometers, or four times ten to the sixteenth meters, or four times ten to the nineteenth millimeters. So this is an enormous, enormous, enormous uh, distance uh, change, and. So if you could somehow measure something, push if you could measure the accuracy of the distance between the Earth and the nearest star to the accuracy of the width of one human hair, you'd have done a pretty good job. So that's what was done. That's why they got the Nobel Prize, and that's why it took 50 years to do. So let's see how they did it. All right, so they have a gravitational wave observatories. These were built. They took a huge amount of funding and money, and they were there and uh, by the National Science Foundation. And the two observatories uh, that were built, each of them has two long rulers, and you compare and contrast the strain difference between the two of the rulers, and they change with time, and they change with time in a very peculiar way. And so all what we're doing is, is each of the few, each of the lengths of each of the arms of this interferometer, which are the long, long, long things that stretch away from the central building, those things are about four kilometers long. And so if, if the length that they're bouncing things off of, the, the length that they're measuring is four kilometers, then they have to measure something that's about that's smaller than the width of a proton, which is 10 to the minus 18th meters. A proton is about 10 to the minus 15th meters, so we're looking at the shift of something that is being shifted only one thousandth of a proton. And so you have to build something pretty accurate to do. So what exactly are they looking for? They're looking for interference patterns in waves. So what do we mean by interference patterns? So you take two rocks and throw them into water like this, and you get waves rippling out on the surface of the water. And if we look closely at the at the places where the water gets, where the two waves meet, they, they combine and get higher, and that is called a constructive interference. And that's where we see it brighter and higher because it's reflecting sunlight. And then between the waves at the dips, it looks darker because of destructive interference as the waves go flat. So the, the waves pass through each other, one is positive, one, they, they cancel each other out because the trough of one wave meets the, meets the peak of the other, and when that happens, they cancel each other out and they're flat. And that's called destructive interference. So we're going to look for, in some way, constructive and destructive interference as the waves pass by and change the lengths of these rulers that we've built in, in these two locations. So what kind of waves are we looking for? They're not water waves. They're really weird looking waves. These are the kind of waves that we're looking for. Notice they do have a sinusoidal variation, meaning they get, they, they go fast when they're in the circular form and they go out to the edge and they slow down. But there's two polarizations to these waves and, you, and both of them are demonstrated here. One of them is called cross polarization or X polarization, that's on the left. And the other is called plus polarization or or just plus polarization on the right. And these waves are affecting test particles as they pass through. So these dots are like test particles that are being affected by a traveling gravitational wave. That wave is coming out of the screen towards you. And that's what's happening, or into the screen from you. So they're coming perpendicular to the screen as you're watching this video. And those are the, those are the exact, this is how the stretching occurs. So notice if you have a combination of these things, it stretches it in one direction and squishes it in the other. And if you build, and they're right, and each of these stretchings and squishings is right angles to each other, right? So since they're not like 45 degrees in either the plus or the cross, the squishings are perpendicular to each other. 
Now, I said this is like going into the screen or out of the screen, but let's look at it from the side and make it look really pretty. So this is what it would kind of look like if you could visualize a gravitational wave passing from, say, the uh, let from, from the upper right of this image all the way to the lower left. It's a very strange sort of tube-like, worm-like shape. So what's ha you can see that the squishing, it look at any individual circle or that or, or squished ring, it goes, the wave propagates along the tube. And so these waves propagate in this manner. It's not that they get fatter and thinner. They're getting squished and stretched as they go. You can follow any individual one of the hoops and it's behaving exactly like I showed you before, but they behave sequentially and that's the wave-like behavior we're talking about the speed of the propagation of that wave we're slowing it down really massively of course because it propagates at the speed of light so this is this is the propagation effect of gen of of gravity through space so when any massive object or any object changes its position well it has to be super massive in order to make massive gravitational waves but these gravity um, and they move fast enough so that things can kind of rearrange with each other more quickly. But a very massive gravitational wave event, some sort of alteration in space-time, will cause all of space-time to do this as the waves propagate outward. And this is the method by which they propagate. Remember, we talked that Einstein, that Newton said that that the force due to gravity, not a force anymore, but the shape of space-time. The shape of uh, the force due to gravity was uh, that Newton thought of only depended on the masses and the distance. However, Einstein said it took time for the change in gravity to affect something distant. So the concept of gravitational waves comes way back from, from, uh, from Einstein's thinking, but he didn't think there was any way to ever measure it or even if it was real. He just thought it was probably just, you know, it, was, it wasn't real, that it was a coordinate thing and it was just something that would be worked out. But it ended up being that, yes, there is an actual stretching and squishing, and length actually does change, while the coordinates don't change. And what do we mean by coordinates again, that the coordinates are not changing? Notice how the hoops are not getting near, well, they're kind of getting stretched and squished, squished along each other. But see the little lines that connect them to kind of demonstrate that's kind of this wormy pattern? Are there, you notice that there's not more worm pattern lines being inserted or created. They're the same number of worm lines. I'm just calling them worm lines. But they're the same number of lines, and those lines are the coordinates. So you can say that how many, on the far left-hand side, you say, well, how many coordinate, say, worm lines are there around? And I guess to my eye, I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there's eight steps around. We can think of eight, eight pegs connecting each ring to each oscillating ring. So you don't increase the total number of, of steps. The size of the steps themselves change, and that is the stretching and squishing of space-time. So the geodesic itself is the measurement of the change of, of, of the metric. But, the, but because of the tininess of the change, this is not a change in coordinates because there's still eight steps. Not, it doesn't grow to be like 10 steps. See how the ring doesn't grow and there's all of a sudden 10 steps? No, it stays eight steps around a ring, especially that end ring on the left. So that's what we meant by the coordinate system is staying the same, but the length is changing. So notice the stretching of the lines between them, how they're actually oscillating. That is definitively a change in length as the oscillations go and propagate through. All right, so that's the propagation of a wave and what their shape is. So how do you measure this thing? Well, you use what's called a laser interferometer. And a laser interferometer takes a laser source, it, bound, it shines it at a half-silvered mirror, so half the laser can propagate through the half-silvered mirror, and the other half can get reflected. Then the wave of light goes down and bounces off of a very steady target that doesn't move. And then the two beams then come back together and then recombine after one passes through the mirror and the other passes along it. And then, the, then if a wave propagates through, 
then the actual length of the arms changes with time. And you can see that the arms are getting squished and stretched, and the waves then themselves are either in or out of phase. If they're in phase, they constructively interfere and make a little bright light, and if they're out of phase, they destructively interfere. So as the arms change, you get a flicker, and that flickering of the light that we saw in the original thing, that chirping, is what was seen. So it basically saw, saw lots of background static, maybe the light was just shimmering a little bit, and then all of a sudden they went whoop, and there were just like a really, really, really fast change where it vibrated very, very, very quickly, and the lengths of the two arms, one got shook really hard, and the other one uh, got shook in the other direction. So the, what's being measured then is a time difference in the paths, and that's how the length of the length works, is that be, even though the coordinate distance has not changed, since the path length has changed and light has the same speed, then there is a time difference, and that's why the waves can be in and out of phase, and then create the interference pattern that we see. So the beam, that's this, the, there's a laser beam, the thing in the middle is called a beam splitter, and when they're in the, this interference pattern, uh, it, it passes them together, and that's why this is called a, uh, a, um, an, a laser interferometer, because we measure the interference pattern as something affects one of the arms of the, la of the interfer interferometer. So again, the ability to do this was, was scaled up over the course of about 20 years to be able to measure the width of something that's 1,000, a shake that was only the thousandth of the size of, an, of a proton. So how big is a proton? So what, they, what a bunch of wonderful people did is they created a, uh, this was created by T-Pile at Caltech to, to show you the exact size of a, of a proton and exactly how big the shake was. So now we're down by that blue thing, and that's a proton at 10 to the minus 17th meters. So the tiny shake was four times 10 to the minus 18th meters. This is this shake is so small that if the proton were a ball, it you couldn't see. You it would be like walking on the surface of the Earth. That's and you know you can see the curvature of the Earth. The proton is so big compared to the size scale of the shaking due or the movement due to it that actually the wave would see a flat surface of, as it pushed it across. So this is an amazing, amazing concept that there's the electron zipping around the hydrogen, a hydrogen atom. And so the center of a hydrogen atom is a single proton down to below 10 to the minus 15th meters, 16th, 17th, and 18th meters. And the, as the gravitational wave passed through, that's the shake that it did, and that created the tiny, tiny whip that came back and forth. That's why it took 50 years, and that's why Kip Thorne didn't think he could actually see it, because this is a very tiny effect. It's extremely tiny. So let's see exactly what the places are that we're able to actually see this effect, these gravitational waves that did this. So there are currently uh, only a few gravitational waves in existence in the world. And there's the LIGO group there, which has two observatories, one in Hanford, Washington, the other in Livingston, Louisiana. There's the GEO 600 and the Virgo collaboration, which is now online. This is an old slide, uh, which, is in, which is in Southern Europe. And then there's the uh, approaching the CAGRA, the Kamioka, Kamioka, uh, gravitational wave detector, Kagra, which is going to be coming online uh, pretty soon, should be online now. In fact, it is. And then there's one that was there's LIGO in India. The Indian government uh, broke ground uh, uh, starting in 2016 to start beginning it. So there literally are only four active gravitational wave observatories today, with Kagra being coming online pretty soon. So you have these things. And that's what's detected it. They're very expensive to build. They're extraordinary. They take extraordinary technological achievement in order to do. And they take a dedicated uh, funding source as well as uh, support by governmental support. These cannot be done by private investors in any way. So this is your tax dollars discovering some of the fundamental aspects of the cosmos. That's really what's happening for US citizens listening to this, uh, this video. 
So let's look at some of the observatories. This is LIGO Livingston, and you can see the main facility in the middle and the two arms, one stretching to the north and one stretching to the west, and there's an access road there. Uh, they put this in Louisiana because they, you know, they found a place where there's not a lot of people around. That was part of the goal, and they want to make sure nobody's going to come up, come up to it and mess with it. Even still, uh, they have a, 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 in some public talks that they've saw that they the Livingston detector. They've had to do some repairs because some people come on up there and they think, hey, that looks like something fun to shoot. So they've actually repaired some damage to the sides of it due to entertaining people that hit it with a with a uh, with a shotgun. So that's actually been done. In any event, they now encase this whole thing in concrete, and there's a big moat around it, lots of high energy, lots of lots of high fences with barbed wire and. So they got a lot of security there too, whatever. In any event, it has to be secure and it has to be very, very far from where things are really happening. So Louisiana's got a bunch of alligators and they take it offline whenever there's a hurricane. All right, so the other one is in some place that literally nobody goes to. This is in Hanford, in Hanford in Eastern Washington. And Eastern, this area of Eastern Washington was a nuclear bomb test facility. So it's one of the most radioactive locations in the United States, uh, other than the Trinity site and some new, and some radioactive dump zones near uh, near near reactors. And so what we see is one of the chambers going off to the left uh, above and one going to the right. Uh, one to the left and one above, and each of the lengths of these arms is about four kilometers, so these are perspective views, and those are incredibly long arms. The detectors are so incredibly sensitive, remember they have to be able to see the motion of a proton, that at LIGO Hanford, they're able to detect when the tumbleweeds hit the outside, because they actually have to go clean the tumbleweeds off of this thing, because it is the upper desert. So tumbleweeds will come and they'll hit the side of the thing and when there's a big wind, lots of tumbleweeds hit and they go, what the heck is that? And they get a signal and it ends up that tumbleweeds have been hitting it. They also can detect when Jupiter is in the sky and when it's below the horizon. They can also detect when somebody, when big trucks are driving on the highway about 10 miles away. And they can also detect when there's a building demolition in a nearby city. So. That's how sensitive they are. So they have to continuously model what they see as noise. Because background noise can be something like clouds going overhead, or rain, or somebody walking into the facility and dropping their keys on their desk. It's, a, it's really quite that sensitive. So when people go into these facilities, it's a quiet zone, and things got to be really clean. Can't be no hoarders in these places because you can't have things falling down. So it's a it, there's there's very little mess in these environments, and uh, and when they do have that kind of mess, they they try to eliminate all those messes. In any event, nothing falls, or at least try not to make things fall in there because it can cause a signal. And that's what I heard from many of the other researchers. And there's amazing talks if you go to TED and look for them. So here's the inside of where the two beams meet. The laser beams meet is where the uh, where the interferometer beams meet. You can see a tube on the right hand side going down that goes out one arm and a tube going up to the left and that's the other arm and in the center is where the beam splitter is and where the detector and where the interferometric detector is. And here's a worker looking over one of the beams, one of the beam tubes as it goes out. Uh, and you can see that they try to keep it clean. They try to keep as many things as they can. And, you know, it, it's, you know, hair dropping on the floor is kind of important because you don't want your hair getting inside those tubes because it has to be insanely clean inside the laser tubes. So these are four kilometer laser tubes that must be evacuated and made to a perfect vacuum, or at least as best as they can. So they try to keep them uh, wildly clean, clean room clean, so there's nothing to, no dust to reflect off of in order to make fake interference patterns. So you have to go in with, with clean hands and, and make sure you have a mask on so you don't breathe stuff out and get moisture inside there as much as you can. And then when they evacuate it, they have to make sure the temperature and humidity is just right and they check for dust particulates and so forth. So when they're actually uh, installing these things, they have to, the, one of the biggest concern is cleanliness inside of the tubes themselves. Well, what's at the ends of the tubes? At the far ends of the tubes are, are optical, are these wonderful mirrors because it's lasers. So the mirrors have to be really quite perfect 
And so they have to be prepared in, in such a way that the mirrors uh, are incredibly flat. The material out of which they're made is almost completely pure, so there's no imperfections in them as much as possible uh, in order to assure that the laser does not it do, bounces correctly, as well as that there's no imperfections that lead to strange mass distributions or wagging of it as it as because you don't want, you, you have to have a macroscopic thing, so the measurement of it has to be very accurate. You don't want it to be out of balance in any way. That includes its chemical composition as well as its surface as well. So once these things get installed, they kind of look like this, and this is just before sealing up the end of the chamber, well, at the very far end where the mass would be reflected off of. And so this, this will be inside its own chamber, and this chamber will then will then be uh, the target of the laser and it will be reflected off of this surface. And the mirrors are, well, the only way you can actually see this thing is because the light is coming, the light is being reflected off of a, uh, at some glancing angle. And without that, these optical surfaces have to be nearly perfect in their, in their, in their surfaces as well as their chemical composition. So that's the only way you can actually see them is that there's a side reflection. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to look directly at the surface. But now once we look more carefully, we can say, well, how do they actually do what they're doing? And they call these mirrors test masses. So the test mass is the thing that they're seeing if it's moving away or towards. Now, the arm is the length of the laser beam. And so the, uh, the length of the laser beam goes from where the laser comes out of the beam, out of the beam splitter, and then goes hits this test mass, and the test mass reflects the laser back to the beam splitter. And what they've done is that there's multiple there's multiple layers to the entire uh, to the entire system, and in fact there's four layers in a quad a quad suspension system. And if you look at the little graphic that I have there, you if you can you can try this at home. Take four equal lengths of string and put like a little fob, say like a like a, a bunch of uh, locks or something like combination locks. So tie some combination locks together on a series of strings like this. And in fact, probably nothing that can swing. You don't want any other additional swinging. So you want something like, like maybe, I don't know, something that's not going to provide extra swings to them. Maybe uh, billiard balls or something. Tape, tape, bil tape some string to these billiard balls. Tape it down really hard. Wrap it up tight. And then put them together. Now hang them in this way. And then shake your hand back and forth rapidly. Just back and forth in a little quick motion. The bottom one will move almost not at all. These quad suspension systems are used in extremely, uh, like really expensive cars like Maybachs to give you these incredible uh, rides that are very smooth. So your better your suspension system, the more independent motions where waves can be dampened, the better. So I invite you to kind of try this at home with four separate things and just shake it fast. Now, of course, if you move it slowly, the whole thing's going to, of course, move. But if you just give it a pulse at the top, left or right or back and forth, but not up and down, but back either to the side to side, and the bottom one won't move at all because the others above it will uh, will take up the slack. And so each of these mirrors weighs about 40 kilograms. And, within there, and at the top, they're held by silica glass fibers. And these fibers are the things that connect them. So these tiny, tiny thread-like, very strong fibers that don't transmit any more of the vibration through them. And so there's another look at what one of the in the, the beam the uh, the test masses look like in the beam splitter chamber. All right. So once they do that, then they put it all together and they've split the beam and they reflect it off of it and look for the signals. Here's what the test signals look like. This was the actual timing and profile of the signals that they looked for and observed. So at the bottom was a was a frequency spectrum to show what the frequency of the of of the wave was as a function of time at the two locations, Hanford and Livingston. And this was what was, uh, this is what was seen for the first gravitational detection. Now what we can see is that there's, that there is actually, uh, there's an observational frame, which is at the top. And then the bottom one is a simulation. The middle frame is numerical relativity. Meaning you want to, you don't just want to do this. You want to know that you're actually going to get something done. So one of Kip Thorne's uh, major contributions to this was to promote the theoretical understanding of how these gravitational waves would look. 
So if you collide this thing together and smash that thing together, smash two black holes together, maybe one's bigger than the other, maybe one's smaller than the other, maybe they have spins, maybe they have an elliptical orbit, etc., etc. And you make huge computer simulations, and that's called numerical relativity. And when you put them together and say, well, this is what it should look like, you make a whole bunch of waveforms, and you do that in advance, very far in advance, and then once you get a signal, you check it. You say, oh, it's like one of those signals, and or it's not like one of those signals. So tumbleweeds hitting the surface of it will not make this kind of signal. A distant a plane, a plane flying overhead will not make a signal that looks like this. Only two colliding black holes made a signal like this. And the residual, which is the third frame down from the top, is the background noise they had to eliminate. So the background noise could be like planes, clouds, dust, somebody's cat meowing 10 miles away. It could be a lot of different things. And notice that the two waveforms, and here was the thing that convinced them, is that the two observations, the one in Hanford and the one in, and the one in Livingston, were measured at almost exactly the same time. Almost exactly the same time. The difference between the measurements of Hanford and Livingston, Louisiana, was their light travel time between the two locations. So if you shown a laser from Hanford, Washington to Livingston, Louisiana, and you would say, how long does it take for light to get from there to there? That was the time delay that was seen between the two signals. So that's how they knew they came from the same exact source. And they notice the chirp signal is, is nearly identical. In fact, it's, it's, practi it's for all practical senses identical. And both of them detect the same, right, saw the same event, the same time frame, and everything. So that's how they knew that this was the same thing. Now, they made the observation in September, and I remember that Christmas time, I actually visited my family. My mother and father live in Brownsville, Texas, and uh, one of the research groups is at Brownsville, Texas, University of Texas at Brownsville. So I went and visited a couple of people there who I know, Joe Romano and Matt Benquista, who were on faculty at UTB at the time. Uh, I think Joe's moved on, but I think Matt's still there. He might still be. I forgot. I, haven't, I didn't bother to check before saying this. But anyway, at the time, they were there, and I visited, and only three months prior, this gravitational wave signal had been detected, and they'd been running all sorts of simulations and checks, and they'd been checking it like mad. They'd been in the middle of their checks, and I went in, and I said, hey, I think this gravitational wave stuff is really cool, and I want to give public talks on it. I've given a couple public talks. And they have a gravitational wave, because since they're part of the consortium, one of the many universities, and they were two out of the 1,200 people that are researching it, their public relations person overheard me from the hall and said, oh, I'll get you some stuff. And she went out and got me a whole stack of posters and cards and things. And, and they just smiled and looked and said, this is really cool. Yeah, it's pretty big. And they just talked about you know, normal stuff. They, would, they, they talk about physics and things that they did not give in. Hey, get, they didn't tell me anything. That was a bummer. They didn't tell me anything. They knew I was talking about this. They knew I put in a crazy little proposal for what trying to look for them in New Jersey, but whatever. That's neither here nor there. Anyway, that was kind of fun, and there's my shout out to them and their tight lippedness because a lot of people had to be real tight lipped because they didn't announce it till February. <laughs> anyway, so here's what this signal's source looked like if you were to simulate what the gravitational waves in space time were to appear to be far from the black hole at the moment of the event that happened in September, that was observed on September 14th, 2015, and it's been slowed down about 40 times. Remember, this happened in, over the course of like a, a quarter of a second, and as it did so, like three quarters of a second was its total time, and it took about a quarter of a second for it to actually occur. So you see that the waves propagate out with uh, through space, and they actually, the strong, the, the, the space itself gets pushed in these incredible wave formats. But once it's together, it rings down into that, and the gravitational waves ripple outward in space. Notice it has this double lobed feature. And so I, I went, look at the early segments that the, in the early part, you see one going each way, like two arms to this. And that gives kind of what they call a quadrupole shape to the ripples 
and that and that's part of the, what's being seen by the two uh, and, and so that that is an expected result for gravitational waves all right and the only reason we're looking at this two-dimensional view is because the universe is three dimensions and the gravitational waves propagate out in all directions but what we're really looking for is is be, it's really hard to visualize going in three direct three dimensions. So we have, we pretend that we're in a fictitious fourth dimensional space, looking down on this, and the waves going up and down into the blue are that. So the compression and rarefaction are the waves themselves in space time in our space. All right, so if we really wanted to look at it from a alien fourth, fifth dimensional being sort of thing, where four dimension of space and one dimension of time, here we see uh, the event here. This is a simulation showing the collision of the two black holes, and the surface is actually our universe viewed from uh, some hyperdimensional, hypothetical, flat, high dimensional space in which our universe is embedded, so a fourth dimensional space. So our universe to them would look warped as a two-dimensional sheet because now we just remove one third dimension just to make it easy to visualize. Otherwise, you have to have three eyes in order to see it. And around each one of the black holes, the space bends down into this crazy, crazy, crazy funnel shape. And that warps the space-time due to the black hole's enormous, enormous mass, both of them. They have em enormous mass, about 30 times the mass of the sun. And the various colors depict how time is flowing. All right? So we're going to come back to this. I hope it'll replay. I'm, I'm pretty sure I said rerun the image. I hope I did. But the near the black hole, uh, the colors depict the rate at which time flows. So as time flows normally, ah, very good, near the black hole, the, the waves uh, in the green region, that's time flowing at a normal rate. Yellow, in the yellow areas, time is slowed by 20 to 30 percent, and in the where it's red, time is almost stopped. So that's another way of looking at that, is that the, the flow of time is, is in that particular way. So the redder it is, the slower time is going. Um, when we're looking at the nature of the arrows, those arrows depict the um, the the arrows depict how the how space is flowing. So when we think about the direction of the flow of space itself, we can think of uh, of exactly how what the free fall rate of a, of something is at that location, and. The free fall rate at near where it's red is the arrows indicate that, that the, the rate of flow of space time. And I described what that means in a different video uh, when I talked about Andrew Hamilton's concept of the of a river of space time, where we can think of the arrows as flowing towards mass. And so space can be thought of as flowing. And the bigger the arrow, the greater the flow of space time. And so you can even see that space-time itself is being warped and changed because as they orbit each other, space itself is being dragged around and the arrows show the direction of the dragging around. And the waveform that is created by these two things, the simulated wave flow. So we have a numerical simulation that shows the wave pattern and then we also have the numerical simulation that gives rise to the visualization as well. And the blue area on the outside shows the propagation of the... Um, of the of those things. So just before it the two black holes collide, they as they're merging, we slow down the rate of the movie rapidly, and uh, we see that there's these enormous bucklings and shiftings of space time. As space time itself gets warped radically, some of the greatest warpage of space time since the Big Bang, and in that warping, three times the mass of the sun is taken away from the black holes to create the waves that you see propagating outward. So we can think of that as the most incredible storm that's ever been seen. And it's more like a space-time storm as the, as the fabric of space and time, the warping. And now, as you heard, that space-time has sounds, the woof of space-time. Uh, as, as, a, as the warp and wolf of space-time has an enormous storm like a crack of a whip or a chirp as they go out. If you were close to this, you wouldn't survive. This close, you'd be dead. So again, the course was all about million ways to die, and this is an incredible 
really bizarre way of going. So one more time, seeing it get slower and slower, and the arrow of space-time flows faster and faster towards it, and time itself slows down, and the warping in the physical dimension of space gets now rebent in multiple ways, curved back upon itself, not just again anti-gravitationally, see up is like anti-gravitationally, and then away. So this is an, uh, a strong stretch in terms of uh, space and time as, as mass is converted into gravitational waves. All right, so what does that look like here? Um, this is interesting. So as the gravitational wave passed through the Earth, this is a really funny little animation made by Dr. Hurd at Caltech at, the, at, the, at MIT in the LIGO lab. We see that the Earth actually gets stretched and squished. That's, you know, that's an extraordinarily exaggerated view, of course, because we know that the stretching and squishing was only about the size of one thousandth the size of a proton, so yeah, that's not it. However, if the Earth were much closer, that would occur. If the Earth were within less than a light year, this would be what would happen. So that's kind of a really wonderful thing to think that some things that this close got affected in this way. I think that would cause a few earthquakes, a few maybe, yeah. It would also cause, you know, your milk to fall off your table. Okay, so where did it happen in the sky? When the gravitational waves uh, were, de were, were detected, the funny thing is, is that because it's just two, L, two of them, they can only detect roughly where they are in the sky. And so because they were only detected by the two detectors, this is as best they got. These oval-like banana shapes are a result of the location of the, of, of the timing between the two, uh, Lanford, Hanford and Livingston, as well as the most probable areas get brighter and brighter and greener and greener. So the, the inner circuit, the inner yellow line is where it's their 10% confident where it is. And the purple line is their 90% confident that it was inside that purple area. And so you can get tighter and tighter and tighter in and say, maybe that's it. So it could be from the Magellanic Cloud. Nobody knows. But it had to have been much, much further than that. Because where these things occurred is that because of the waveforms and how quiet they are, the, measure, the measurement of the waveform said that they were approximately 1.3 billion light years away. Because the, the gravitational waves travel at the speed of light, they then are, that's how far they go. So this, is, this was the first detection of gravitational waves by, by, the, by, by anybody in the entire history of, of the world. And it won, it won them the Nobel Prize for this discovery for, something, for two black holes that collided 1.3 billion years ago. And the, light, and the signal from it arrived here uh, at, uh, on September of 2015. Now, what we find is that, is that there are more ways that gravitational waves can be made other than this. There are many ways gravitational waves can be made and that's just one of them. Colliding black holes are one. And the most important thing about gravitational waves was discovered extremely recently, and that's coming up next time. See you soon.